This is Distant Replay, the podcast that goes back in time to relive all the greatest events that we witnessed in sports. From upsets, to championships, to cultural moments, we discuss it all. Coming up on today's episode. Another sneaky right hand. Back to October 30th, 1974. We're going to Africa. It is the rumble in the jungle. And Mike, you told me before we started recording that this now we've done this is episode 72. That's not even counting the true crime episodes, not counting the documentary recaps, just events. And you told me that this is the favorite event out of all those we've done so far. This event had everything. The scene was great in Zaire. The fighters were all all time fighters. You have a nickname for it, the Rumble in the Jungle. Everything about this event was top notch. And look, I wasn't being dramatic before. This is the favorite event of mine that we've done. It's a great one. We're going to take you all the way through it because you've heard about this fight. There's plenty of talk about this fight and the, the thrill in Manila. I mean, these these fights with these big nicknames have have kind of grown their own. Um, they've kind of they, they've grown in lore over the years, and they really just. I mean, you think about fighting and boxing. You kind of go back to this era. So we're going to take you back to this era. And Mike, you're going to kind of take me through kind of where we are because we're right in the height of, of a, one of the best eras in all of boxing. So we'll go through that. The lead up to this fight, how they actually ended up fighting in Zaire of all places. We'll explain that. Obviously, Don King had a big part of that. Also, the fallout, everything that happened during this fight and what happened afterwards as well in terms of uh, the careers of Ali and, and Foreman and then boxing in general. So there's a lot to get to. And if you haven't gone through this fight, Sit back and enjoy the conversation, and then go back and watch this. We're going to put it up on our website, distantreplaypodcast.com. You need to watch it for yourself. It's it's well worth what the hour that uh, the video is from start to finish. It's, it's tremendous. It's one of the greatest fights of all time, one of the greatest sporting events of all time, and we'll put it up on our website. But you can also connect on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube as well. Please like, subscribe, follow us wherever it is that you uh, that you listen. So. Mike, let's get started. Let's let's begin with kind of the background on where we are in boxing because when we're going to this fight, Foreman's the guy. Foreman is the the heavyweight champ. Ali is looking to reclaim that that title at age thirty two. Yeah, Foreman is the twenty four year old upstart, forty and zero, with thirty seven knockouts. Right, so that's the George Foreman we're talking about in this fight. And I'll get to some of the other like startling statistics from his reign as heavyweight champion here in a second, but. Where we're at in the heavyweight division at this time is it starts on March 8th, 1971 with Ali Frazier 1, known as the fight of the century at Madison Square Garden. Okay, That fight is won by Joe Frazier. Then on January 22nd, 1973, Frazier loses to Foreman. Okay, So now Foreman is the heavyweight champion of the world. Earlier in 1974, remember this event is taking place in October of 1974, late October. In January of 1974 is Ali Frazier 2 to determine who would fight Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle. Ali wins that rematch with Frazier to go on and fight Foreman. Then you have this fight in the timeline. And then on October 1st, 1975, so nearly a year after this fight, you have what's known as the Thrilla in Manila, Ali Frazier 3, which I think as we all know, Ali won that fight as well. So you have this this time period in boxing, I think it's harkened back to a lot because I think boxing's lost some of its steam, uh, maybe all of its steam in some people's eyes. Hmm. And we look back to these eras, you know, you think of this era, you think of the, the 90s, uh, you think of the 90s, you think of Mike Tyson, you think of... Sugar Ray Leonard, Thomas Hearns, uh, you know, that era of boxing, Roberto Duran. You know, you think you boxing fans are sort of forced to live, you know, through these great periods in time because maybe now's not that great. 
And this is probably the marquee time period for the sport. Yeah, and we should probably mention too that he that Ali fought Ken Norton too for the first time, lost to him in seventy three, March of seventy three, ended up beating him in the rematch, but did have that loss uh, as well. And this is after remember Ali was suspended uh, out of the sport for three years because he didn't go fight in the war, and you know he's kind of coming back and kind of trying to restake his claim. And it took him a while to get back to the spot to even get a chance for these fights. And then you know he took advantage with that win over uh, Joe Frazier and early 74, which set up this showdown with George Foreman. And this was supposed to be in September of 74, but <laughs> Foreman, in the middle of sparring, took an elbow to the uh, to the head and had to get 11 stitches, and it ended up pushing the fight back a month as he recovered. So there was, you know, even they had plenty of drama and buildup, but even more so because this thing got pushed back an extra month. It got pushed back an extra month, and why it got pushed back an extra month which was the end result of that is, you know, Foreman's not able to spar much in the lead up to the fight. And I think that would have an impact on the fight and how the fight sort of uh, transpired, as we'll get to a little bit later. But definitely a storyline you don't want to overlook is the fact this fight was originally supposed to be on September 24th, and now it's October 30th, and we're finally going to get to the fight. So this fight, as I mentioned, held in Zaire in the 20th of May Stadium. Um, which has now been renamed since that point. And by by the way, Zaire, for those not familiar, is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. So it's changed names as well. But you go back to the history of kind of how this thing happened. Don King arranged the fight. Don King, everybody knows the famous boxing promoter. He's been in the game for a long time. So he arranged this fight with a, with a music businessman, okay, who actually brought his musicians to play at the venue for this fight. But basically, King got... Ali and Foreman to sign separate con- contracts saying they would fight for him if they could get a $5 million purse apiece, which was a lot of money, obviously, at that time. Um, still is a, a nice chunk of change, but at that time was huge. But he got them to sign kind of separately so these guys wouldn't go out and sign with other boxing promoters to get that Foreman-Ali match. But King didn't have any money, and he couldn't stage a fight of this magnitude in the U.S. I'm not sure the whole background on how that happened, but just kind of reading the history of the fight, he couldn't stage that. So he went outside the country. And then he knew a, a guy that was an advisor to the Zaire's dictator, okay, Mike? <laughs> and they persuaded this guy, the dictator, that this high-profile event is going to help your regime, right? It's going to get you a lot, of, uh, a lot of eyeballs on your country. You're going to look even more powerful than you are. And we're going to put your fight here as well. Another interesting side note to this, uh, Gaddafi, remember the Libyan dictator? He was a, actually a, fi- a primary financial sponsor of this event. Did you have any idea about that? I didn't have any idea of anything <laughs> you just went into. And is it a surprise that Don King has the inside track to a, a dictator from Zaire? I right. Mean, Don King, man. I, I mean, I think anyone who knows Don King knows his history. Probably not a surprise that he, you know, he sort of had to go uh, the route he did to get this fight on. But look, it ends up being one of the greatest sporting events of all time. So there's not really a focus on what he had to do to get this fight to happen. Yeah, so he had to work with Zaire's dictator and then uh, Libya's dictator. And, and I mean, Gaddafi provided the purse money for the athletes and covered a lot of the the, the big expenses for this entire event. So that that I had no idea about, uh, which is crazy to think about now that you know uh, these these guys were heavily involved in this in this fight in this event, and it you know. Yeah, we think of it now as just a huge sporting event. <laughs> but you look at how this thing was put together. You know, King pulled it off, but the way he got there is pretty wild. But um, so they, they obviously this is a huge event. And, and when you look at this on video, I think 60,000 people were there. But the way this thing's set up is like this this stadium is it's an interesting kind of layout stadium, pretty wide, pretty big stadium, uh, multi use uh, stadium. But you had the ring in the middle, and it seemed like they had. I don't know, maybe a thousand seats set up around the ring and then a huge area, you know, of space between that and then like the actual stands of the the venue. It was a very weird layout and it seemed like anybody that wasn't in that close vicinity probably didn't have much of a view. Yeah, it was like the few haves right near the ring and then all the have nots like set really far back. Like they showed an they show an overview, like a wide angle shot of the ring. And it's almost like you don't even know you're looking at the fight. It's like they're showing a different area of the arena, you think, uh, when, when they show the shot. that If you go back and watch, you'll see exactly what Ben's talking about. It's pretty startling. It's wild. It, it's crazy how they decided to set, the, set it up the way they did. But, um, hey, everybody came out 
and, and watch. So, you know, it is what it is. But to see it the way that that thing was laid out was pretty pretty wild. The other thing that's crazy about this, there was over did, – did you see how many viewers they estimated watched this fight? I didn't. How many? One billion viewers worldwide, they estimated, which is obviously a record. But – were they were they like were they like man like a billion people are watching this or was it like know. really a substan- substantiated number? <laughs> I, I, you know I mean? like, I, yeah, I have no idea. Oh man, a billion people probably watch that fight. No, but <laughs> yeah. at the time that that would have been one in every four people in the world would have seen that fight. So that seems a little outlandish. Could be a Don King statistic. I think that's kind of what you're you're it's kind of what you're hitting out there. But I mean that that's remarkable. Um, even in in the UK where this this fight aired, obviously too half of the UK population at the time, 26 million, which was about half of the 56 they had, were watching the fight. So, I mean, and you just don't to think give of, you a sense. And, and, and when you don't think of England as being a big boxing hotbed either. Right. You know, and, you know, one other thing to keep in mind for maybe people who are younger listening to this, you know, we're at the time where like a big heavyweight boxing championship bout is m- maybe on par with like the Super Bowl in terms of interest. Mm-hmm. So... Um, we're not at the point we are now with boxing. So all those fights I, I rattled off at the beginning of the podcast here, you know, you had huge viewership for all of them. Yeah, there's no question. And to, and to give you a sense of how many people were watching just on TV, this is obviously a pay-per-view fight. They had an estimated 50 million viewers worldwide on closed-circuit television, which grossed an estimated 100 million, uh, which that in, inflation adjusted is 520 million today in revenue. But in the U.S., they had 3 million viewers in 400 different venues. The tickets were selling at $20 a piece, which today would be about $100 a ticket to watch this fight in a venue. And it grossed about $60 million in the U.S. alone. Um, and the promoters and fighters received about half of that revenue there. So they got a, a little bit a little bit more there. But um, overall, I think the promoters and sponsors won out a lot more than the two fighters who put on the spectacle when you actually tally up all the numbers. Yeah, after this, Don King had money. Let's put it that way. Yeah, you would say that. He had relationships with two dictators over uh, <laughs> across the across the ocean. So, and he made them money in the process. Oh, so I'm yeah. sure that relationship was just fortified. Oh, can you imagine? So that that's kind of how we got here as well. And and you know, to give you a sense of just how a bit of a, I mean, we think of Ali as the greatest of all time, right? But you know, in this fight, he was a four to one underdog, which is amazing. That just that number, a guy that, that of his skill. I mean, he came into the fight forty-four and two. Yeah, he, he was given up, you know, seven years in age. They were pretty similar in size, although it seemed like Foreman maybe was had a little more mass to him, like just like thicker. But when you look at their actual height and weight, six three two twenty was Foreman, six three two sixteen was Ali. So they're almost identical size. Yeah, and remember when Foreman beat Frazier for the title, Foreman was a three to one underdog in that fight in January of seventy-three. So now we have the lore of George Foreman growing to the point where he's fighting now Ali and is a 4-1 to one favorite. So can't can't overemphasize how Foreman was thought to be pretty much unbeatable at this point. And the announcers even hit on that uh, several times throughout the broadcast. Like, do we even think Ali has a shot here? That's what we're talking about pre-fight. Um, and what was to come, I think that was a re- that's a reason why what was to come uh, is etched in sports lore so much. Right. This so this broadcast, let's get into the fight a little bit here, Mike. Uh, the broadcast, on the call you had Bob Sheridan was play-by-play. Color was done by Jim Brown, yes, the, <laughs> the, the football player. David Frost, who is British, now Sir David Frost. He has since passed away. But then also along with that, Joe Frazier was in attendance, and he actually provided his insight into the broadcast. Interesting mix of crew here. Yeah, and what's important to remember is David Frost during the fight is sort of interviewing Joe Frazier, asking him his thoughts on the fight. So we don't have all of them together. So basically you have a boxing announcer, a football player, and a boxer announcing it, but the boxing announcer and the boxer are not talking to each other. (laughs) So it was kind of like a strange setup in that respect. Oddly, though, I think it worked. Like they made it work. Maybe this the product we were watching was so overwhelmingly good that you would have thought any announcing team was good. Hmm. But I thought in a weird way they made it work. Yeah, I mean Sheridan talked primarily throughout this fight. I mean he he did a really good job of it. And I don't remember Jim Brown a ton. I mean I, Frazier stood out to me the most because he was. I mean obviously his insight. He's got a different perspective than anybody else up there having fought 
you know, these guys and, and, and is there firsthand watching it and providing, you know, what he's seeing. So I thought he was really good, but I mean, overall I thought, I thought these guys did a really good job with it from start to finish. And then, you know, obviously we'll get to the very end with the, with the interview post fight interview with David Frost, who was very active uh, interviewing guys during this, this telecast, but we get into this fight. So the broadcast begins this YouTube link, which we'll have on our website, distant replay podcast.com. You know, it, it starts to beginning with, with Ali coming out. And again, it's, it's, you know, these entrances aren't like what you see now, right? Where you have celebrities hanging out with people. You got, you know, music. You got maybe a rapper walking out with somebody, you know, introducing them, take them to the ring. It was like Ali and I guess a couple of, you know, his obviously his corner. But then also, I guess some type of military police or some type of police. All you see is the white helmets uh, walking out there, kind of surrounding him, ushering him to the ring. And he's kind of, again, walking, you know, out of the underneath the stadium, kind of through not a ton of people as they get to the to the the, the ring and the seats that are immediately surrounding it. And then he t- heads into the ring. But, you know, once he gets there, he's in the ring for like 10 or 15 minutes, Mike, without, with Foreman just kind of hanging out in the back, making him wait. Yeah, and there, there was really no reason given why Foreman. It was literally 10 to 15 minutes in real time. So we're not going to a commercial during this. We're staying with the broadcast here for 10 or 15 minutes, and the announcers are filling in time, even wondering out loud, you know, where is Foreman? But you have Ali coming out. Obviously, if you've seen the Will Smith Ali movie, you know how well he indoctrinated himself to the people of Zaire. Um, it was pretty much like a home game for Ali in that respect. I mean, they got the Ali Boumaye chant going from right from when he comes out of the dressing room to go into the ring. Uh, Ali Boumaye, of course, meaning literally Ali kill him, right? So you got the whole yeah. crowd cheering that. They're getting whipped up in a frenzy. And then when Foreman doesn't come out, it's a little bit of a buzzkill because you're ready to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then obviously now we have Foreman eventually comes out, and uh, you know we're about to get the fight started. Yeah, it took a while. I mean, literally, you know, we're watching this. This this video is about an hour, and this was like I don't know, ten to fifteen percent of the video was us waiting on on Foreman to come out to the ring, and we've seen this this kind of maneuver before. You know, it's it's gameplay, just just trying to make the guy wait, kind of tire him out a little bit, make him think about it um, as as he's coming out. But when Foreman comes out, Foreman like jogs out to the the, the ring, like it was like go time. As soon as it was go time, he was gone. It wasn't. There was no slow pace, methodical hype him up, you know, it was straight into the ring. Let's go. Yeah. Well, once, once he, once he put his mind to it, he actually wanted to come <laughs> in the ring. It, like you said, it was go time. <laughs> and one other thing interesting about that ring, Ben, was Ali wanted a 20 foot ring. Foreman wanted an 18 foot ring to sort of be able to box Ali in a little bit better, thinking Ali was going to try to dance around and they settled on a 19 foot ring. So the size of the ring is really not what I want to focus on here. When I bring this up, it's, were you aware that the boxers got to decide on the size of the ring? No, I had no idea. I just figured it was a standard ring. It's like you play on a basketball court, right? It's the same size everywhere you go. Yeah, I, I never knew that. And, of course, this is a 15-round title fight, right? Something of note, Ben, for George Foreman. I don't know if you picked up on this. But Foreman, all right, he hadn't fought. I mean, they said in this, he hadn't fought. 15 total rounds since like 1972. Yeah, that was wild. That is crazy. His last nine fights hadn't gone past two rounds. And like I said, he hadn't even fought 15 total rounds since 1972. (laughs) And again, between that and the issue with him not being able to spar that much leading up to the fight and potentially affecting his conditioning, I think were major factors in why Ali chose the fighting strategy he did. Yeah, that that stat was crazy to me because he had just fought you know, he just fought Ken Norton and Joe Frazier, two of his last previous three fights before this one. So, you know, he was fighting some 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 pretty stout competition, but still was getting through it pretty easily, which, you know, partly was why he was such a huge favorite, but also played into uh, hit the results of this fight as it got a little bit deeper as we went on. And the only thing I could find, like, you could noticeably tell that, that Ali was a huge favorite. I mean, everything that he did in this fight, every punch he threw was like a, a crowd cheering behind him. Every time that he got a, you know, got a couple of, uh, a combination in there that these guys are on their feet and I, and, and Foreman was like the opposite. It was just quiet, no support for him. The only thing that I really saw, like he just, again, they're two different personalities, right? I think Foreman was kind of just had a, a different image maybe at the time than he does today. We think of this big jovial dude, the selling grills. So maybe it was a little bit different at the time, but the other thing that I saw that was when he got off the plane, he arrived with two German shepherds and that those were the same dogs. This when this country was was colonized by uh, Belgium, 
for like 50 or 60 years in the early 20th century, they use those dogs quite a bit on the people there. So I guess it just really, I don't where know. Did you find that? Where did you find that out? at? They actually had that in the movie. Um, oh, okay. About this, about this fight. So you can actually go back and, and kind of, and kind of get a better sense of that. When we were Kings, uh, that film, they had that nugget. So it's very interesting. I mean, maybe that was just, you know, he had no idea and just had a couple of dogs with him and it just, but that was maybe part of why they didn't like him as much. Who knows? But you could tell Ali was a huge favorite in this fight by everyone there in attendance. And that probably helped him a little bit. And he, he played to the, he played to the crowd. Oh, he loves it. He's jawing at Foreman pre-fight when Foreman finally does make his way to the ring. So the mental games are already starting here for Ali. He's got people chanting to, for him to kill Foreman. You know what I mean? Like, we're 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 in full on gamesmanship mode here early on. So let's get into the fight itself. And again, this you know, you'll see from the jump why Mike and I, I probably don't disagree with you here, Mike. This is, if not my favorite, probably one of the top two or three that we've done so far. Watching this this event by itself, but just from the beginning, I mean, you you know, you see boxing matches now where guys come out and they kind of they're bouncing around. They might throw a few punches or filling each other out. Nobody's that aggressive out of the gates necessarily. But these two guys, as soon as that bell rings, are at one another. And you could see Foreman's, you know, his his strength, those power punches he threw, but you also see that quickness of Ali. And it's still remarkable to watch now. I mean, he's still in his prime at 30, you know, 32 years old. He's on the back end maybe of his prime, but he's still in his prime. And you can kind of tell he is remarkable. With, but his strategy in this fight is an all-timer, right? I mean, you can kind of explain it a little bit. We can kind of go round by round, but... His approach to how he was going to uh, fight Foreman, that's what the story's about. Yeah, so what marks a good event is one that gets you hooked from second one, right? You're locked in. That's what this first round was. Very aggressive from Ali and Foreman. We're talking to both of them throwing haymakers right out of the gate, wasting no time at all, feeling each other out. Like you said, some of these fights these days, the guys dance around for five or six rounds before they actually get to fighting. Well, not in this one. And it set the tone. And I thought this round, the first round, was even. But then starting in round two, okay, we have Ali completely reverse his strategy. The fight slows down. He starts his what is now known as the rope-a-dope strategy. We did not know. The announcers in the moment had no idea what was going on. Yeah. Okay. All this time when Ali is retreating to the ropes, leaning against the ropes, the announcers are doing a good job letting you know that, yes, Foreman is – trying his darndest to get punches in on, on Ali, but they're having no effect on Ali. And every once in a while, when Foreman lets his guard down, Ali's sneaking in jabs to the crowd's amusement, right? The crowd is going crazy with every landed punch by Ali. And when he ties him up, whenever he's tying him up, you can see Ali whispering into Foreman's ear, okay? Mm-hmm. And you would find out later Ali's saying something to the effect of, oh, that's all you got, you know, that's all you got. <laughs> you know, and pretty much egging Foreman on to keep on expending his energy and to keep on punching him, you know. It's the rope-a-dope strategy that I think we're all familiar with. And we see this continue from round two to round seven. And you would think that this is boring to watch, but it's not because you kind of realize you're watching like a perfectly executed strategy that not even people in the know really fully understood what was going on. But as the fight went on, you saw Frazier start to figure it out again, kind of like a fighter's intuition. Mm -hmm. You saw the announcers figure it out. And it was, it was like watching poetry in motion, seeing him execute. And you could see like, it just slowly was wearing down Foreman. And there'd be, there'd be moments where Foreman was, was at Ali. But for the most part, you could just feel it as every round went along that Ali's getting closer and closer to, to finally knocking him out. I mean, there was some some stretches there where you were – I mean, I was shocked that Foreman was even still upright. The guy could take a punch because he took a number of them to the point where his face is puffing up quite a bit. And, and you know, I don't think he ever – probably for Foreman, he didn't ever have to, one, go this deep in many fights. So that was new. But also, I don't think he, he necessarily had to protect himself as much as he needed to in this fight because it didn't seem like he had his hands up too often. I mean, he was going in at, at Ali like he needed to. But there was plenty of openings for Ali, and he struck. You Look, you have in round three is when Foreman started getting impatient, and you could tell what Ali was doing leaning against the ropes was starting to impact him. In round four, 
Ali actually staggered Foreman. Okay, and this is like when you start to see Foreman getting puffy in the face from all these, these jabs Ali's peppering him with. And now Foreman looks like he's starting to get tired to the point where one of the announcers basically says he thinks Ali's going to win it within the next three rounds. Yeah. Round five, I thought, was the best round of the fight because it looks like Foreman is gaining a little bit of traction and maybe making inroads on Ali. But Ali lands some blows that back Foreman up. And I thought in that round, I don't know what you thought, but I thought Foreman might have been saved by the bell there. Yeah. I thought Ali was pretty close to knocking him down there. It, it, it's funny because after that round five, the announcers are still confused to why Ali is leaning so much, leaning up so much against the ropes. But Frazier's the first to point out, like, no, this is this is a strategy here. Like Frazier doesn't have, he doesn't articulate things, maybe how these announcers do. But when he starts to talk boxing. You could tell he's obviously really dialed in, being mm-hmm. the great fighter he was, and he starts to really get at this point after round five. Okay, that this is this is a tactic that that he's trying to to uh, implement here, and at, by the time round six comes around, Foreman is just exhausted. Yeah, yeah, and seven was kind of it was a little uneventful, but then it takes us to eight, and and I agree, six, five, five. Foreman was just, I mean, he, he he hung on just to survive that. And you can even see Ali kind of perked up and kind of gained some energy and showed some life as he, he felt like he probably had Foreman right there. But, again, got out of it. the eighth round. The knockout, I mean, it, there was no question about it. It was another same situation. Ali back on the ropes, kind of got Foreman leaning in a little bit and was able to kind of reverse it get him against the ropes and then it was just it was lights out. I mean, it was it was such a beautiful knockout, Mike. And you know, we we you watch you watch fights today and you know, the 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 caliber of fighters are what they were at this time and even into the 90s. But I mean, this 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 was a thing of beauty watching this this knockout. I mean, we see guys that you know, we see some good knockouts now, just pure power a lot of times, but this was just so tactical in the way he delivered and finally took Foreman out of this fight and just ended it like that. It was it was awesome to watch. Yeah, I mean, you get those people who still like boxing, right? I watch boxing. I'm not into it as much as I used to be, like maybe 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. But people who really like boxing, I mean, they call it the sweet science for a reason. There's a science. There's a strategy behind these boxing matches. It's not all just, hey, let's see how hard we can punch someone. And this fight crystallizes that maybe the most of any fight ever, you know? And... Uh, again, in this round too, Ali in the eighth round even is very, very patient is, is the word I would use to describe him. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's been patiently waiting for his opportunity and he gets it very late in round eight. This, this knockdown happened in the last 20 seconds of round eight. Yeah. And, and it was almost a situation where Foreman got saved by the bell again, but you know, he, uh, you know, Ali knocks him down and wins the fight in what was an absolute classic. And at age uh, 32, Ali is once again heavyweight champion of the world. So when this fight ends, too, by the way, it's a madhouse. Like oh, it is insane. It is like I'm surprised that nobody, either one of these fighters, weren't hurt <laughs> during this. I mean, everybody kind of storms the ring. At one point, it felt like there was probably about 200 people in the ring. Like you can't even see one. I'm surprised the ring didn't collapse. Yeah, and two, you can't even see like where the ropes are in the ring. No. That's how many people are in. It doesn't even look like they're in a ring. And you have no idea where the boxers are. The only only kind of idea that you have is you will see some people getting pushed around, like trying to clear out space. I think at one point Ali like sat down on the on the mat, but it is it is absolute insanity. And even so much so like Foreman's trying to get out of the ring too. Foreman's in his days. Like there's there's no medical attention, Mike, right? I mean, that's what we see now. When when somebody gets knocked down, knocked out, right? There's there's doctors in there, there's medical uh the medical teams in, they're checking him. And, and making sure he's okay. But I don't think there was any of that with Foreman. Like, they got him up, and then finally they can get him out of the ring. I mean, he's, like, stumbling getting to the corner and, like, trying to find space to get out of the ring. And then he's got to walk down the stairs and then like, out of the stadium again by himself. Like, a long walk, and he's, like, he's kind of swaying, stumbling. Like, I felt really bad for the position he was in at that point, but there, there nobody cared. No, once he once he cleared that crowd, they showed a camera shot of him in his, uh, him in his corner, and no one was around him. Yeah, like he he was like all by himself walking to the locker room. It was a kind of like a sad moment, like you said. The guy, got, he, at least he got out of the ring safe though, because like you said, he he just got knocked out. You know, he was staggered to say the least. Um, and then obviously after this, now we get to the uh, post fight interview. What did you think of the post fight <laughs> interview? This this is like classic Ali, right? This is kind of what you think of when when you think of Ali, just very uh, flamboyant, loud, 
not you know very cocky and arrogant speaks his mind i mean it was a it was a very typical boxing interview number one but i it was i don't know exactly where it was i guess it's somewhere inside the stadium it was a weird kind of setting but frost is doing the interview and kind of asking about the fight and he's kind of explaining like his strategy for how he approached this fight and how he knocked down and knocked out george foreman then he goes into i'm the greatest you know, say I'm the greatest. He's even telling him like, "Show me which camera are we on here. Let me talk to the people." It was a it was a classic Ali interview, but it was kind of it was kind of interesting too because he really got into the his religion, being Muslim, and and went down that road quite a bit uh, during this conversation, which doesn't surprise me, kind of given his background and the setting combined. I think it was kind of a free for all. Say what you want. There's there's nothing to worry about in, in this setting that we've got here in Zaire. So. You know, he spoke. He spoke his mind, but that that post post match interview was was just kind of icing on this cake of this entire production. Yeah, it was Ali. Like uh, free form interview is not doesn't even do it justice. <laughs> he kind of had his agenda. He wanted to get out right in some of the things that he that he went through, which he did. And he, also, though, he sprinkled in like valuable information about the strategy, yeah. his fighting strategy, all in like one breath. It seemed like like he would transition from one topic to another. David Frost even had tr- a trouble. David Frost would answer a question, or sorry, ask a question, and Ali would just like give a totally unrelated answer to what David Frost just asked him about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just like he had he he knew what he wanted to say. He said it, and he throws in his float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. His hands can't hit what his eyes can't see. You know, yeah. even though that's like the total opposite of what he did during this fight from a strategy standpoint, you could sort of see in this one interview how it encapsulated how polarizing Ali was, you know, Mm -hmm. people loved him. People didn't love him so much. And man, uh, one thing you can't argue with though, is that the guy was a heck of a boxer. And I think as the years went on, you know, even people that maybe did not agree with some of his decisions he made, um, coming up in the boxing world, I think everyone to a man, like, you know, respects, you know, the kind of athlete he was. And this, this post fight interview though, was it's must see. I mean, the, the boxing match was, 1A, and this interview was 1B. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that completely. So worth watching this entire thing start to finish. Only an hour. We'll have it on our website, distantreplaypodcast.com. And just kind of some postscript for the fight. Foreman tried to get a, a rematch for a number of years, but he eventually would retire in 77. Foreman did. He came back, obviously, a handful of years later and continued to fight into the 90s. But he never got that rematch that he wanted. And eventually these two became really, really good friends. Uh, I think for a while Foreman was upset, angry with the fight and the results and, and maybe not getting the rematch that he wanted, but I think he kind of, kind of hit him at some point, you know, six, seven years later that, you know, he just, he was beat that Ali just straight beat him and he was the better fighter that day. And he eventually let it go and they became really good friends uh, through the years. So a good ending to, to that story. Yeah, you know, it's it's. I think it's it's. These guys are are so caught up in the moment. They're rivals in the moment. But when when the dust settles, you know, there's only a, there's only a handful of guys in the world who have the skill set they do and know what it's like to be like an awesome boxer like that. Mm-hmm. And and just not only that, but just a level of respect they have for each other. When look, hey, look, they went mano a mano, you know, and they respect each other. And in the end, that wins out over maybe some animosity in the moment. You know, Foreman's a competitor, so in the moment he's not going to be okay with losing. You know, which which I think is understandable. And like you said, it, it is good that they were able to uh, to develop a friendship later on. Yeah, no question. So great, great, great match, great event, well worth the time. We've heard all about it. You probably you might have seen, probably seen a movie documenting this fight uh, multiple times, but go back and actually watch it. Take the take the time. It's well worth it and a lot of fun. And and I agree. It, this one is this is one of the ones that. I, this is the reason why we do the podcast, Mike. This is like one of the reasons, like, man, all the time we put in, this, it's a lot of work, not making any money. But you, know, you go back and watch a fight like this, an event like this, and it's like, man, this is, I would never have done it otherwise, right? But we did it, and I'm glad we did. Absolutely. This just gives you the juice to, like, this. I'll be on this high for, like, a month or two <laughs> with this podcast. You know what I mean? In search of the next gem like this. Yeah, we got to put Thrilla and Manila on the list now, too. I, I'm oh, I have a feeling that, that a lot of, the, you know, yeah. That's going on the list. Maybe Ali Frazier one will go on the list. Like we're we're do, we're going to do more boxing. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and then you can get into the eighties and nineties too. There's like the Tyson stuff, I and mean, there's so many different directions you can go with boxing. But 
you know, having opened the door now, uh, I'm with you. I think uh, <laughs> I think it'll be on the list a little bit more often. Uh, if you have a recommendation, though, on a game, an event to go back and watch, uh, let us know. Leave us a comment on YouTube. Uh, connect on Twitter. And uh, make sure you go back to the website, distantreplaypodcast.com, to check this event out in its entirety. But uh, subscribe, share the word, follow us, whatever it is. Just help us continue to grow. We've got a lot of great feedback, and we do appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. As always, you know, we, we, we do this. You know, the, the listeners are what makes this thing go. Thanks for your suggestions. Thanks for subscribing and liking all our videos. And until next time.